and welcome to the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US, a podcast in which we explore the mind-bending world of global supply chain, covering topics such as automation, innovation, unique identity, and more. I'm your co-host, Reed. And I'm Liz. And welcome to the show. Liz, we're ready to jump into your wheelhouse here. We're going to be talking about the metaverse. Aren't you excited? I can't wait, especially because I can't actually define it for anybody, everybody. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, well, um, we have an expert here today, and um, Shelly Palmer from the Shelly Palmer Group. If you go to www.shellypalmer.com, you'll find out everything about him. But Shelly's been around, he's done a lot, and he deserves some props. And so, Shelly, bef- before we actually hear from you, I just, people, I, you need to know. I mean, you, you're a professor of the advanced media in residence at Syracuse University. SI News House School of Public Communications. You're the CEO of the Palmer Group. You consult with Fortune 500 companies all the time on helping them with their technology and media and marketing. You were also named LinkedIn's top voice in technology. Um, You know, I've seen you on Good Day New York. Um, You've been a regular on CNN and CNBC. But, you know, where I'm always leaning in a bit more is... um, you're the co-host, along with Seth Everett, on the award-winning podcast, TechStream. Um, and you have done tons of newsletters. I read your weekly newsletter. It's very informative. I really appreciate it. But you also have a number one uh, Amazon bestseller with uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, NFTs, and smart contracts, an executive guide to the world of decentralized finance, which I think is a great intro because decentralized finance is driving this metaverse from my perspective. So, Shelly, welcome to the show. Thank you. So thank you so much for being here, uh, having me. I'm excited to be here and uh, I'm excited. Um, I want my mom to hear that intro. That's, that's excellent. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? I mean, you're, you're a very hardworking man and, and we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to be with us today. Our listeners are focused on supply chain. So we, we want to you know, pull this back in. Um, I think we should really do two things here today is one, let's just define the metaverse, talk a little bit about it and what it is and isn't. Um, but then also talk about the impact the metaverse is going to have on supply chains or not have on supply chains. But Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be significant. And we have some analogies and and connections to the old and new world. Um, I encourage folks to look at uh, Shelley Palmer's latest um, review of CES uh, Mm -hmm. for 2021. Um, or 2022, rather. I'm sorry. I apologize. We're, we're in the COVID world. I don't know what year it is, you know, type thing. But um, I loved it because you went back to 1994 on the Today Show where they're like, what's the at symbol? No, that's not at. That's the, that's the all or about or. And then they're like, no, 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 it's something to do with the Internet. And Katie Kirk goes, what's the Internet? I remember seeing that episode in 1994. I was working for um, Xerox at the time. Um you know, in network computing. But anyway, so Shelly, please, if you would, level set us on the metaverse. That's a great question because the metaverse, the term metaverse goes back to snow crash. uh, And what it means to to you and what it means to me, probably some different stuff. Most people are, when you say metaverse, they think cartoon characters in a cartoon world, and you immediately go to Sims or Second Life, if you're old enough to remember, Roblox, Decentraland, Fortnite. These are all considered metaverses. Then all of a sudden, Mark Zuckerberg puts a flag on the ground and says, we're not going to be Facebook anymore. We're going to be meta because the metaverse is the future. And I think most people, if you press them, would say cartoon characters in a cartoon universe. That's a metaverse, but it's not necessarily the or all metaverses. I think what's going to separate a metaverse from the regular internet we're in is the cusp that we're on right now between Web 2 and Web 3. There's two initialisms I'll ask you to all research on your own because I don't think we'll have time to cover them today, but I want to touch on them and give you uh, an insight into how to think about what a metaverse is. DID and SSID. DID uh, is an initialism for decentralized identification, and SSID is self-sovereign identification. Now, assuming that you are self-sovereign identified or you're decentrally identified, you are now, in theory, 
in charge of your own data. As opposed to going to Facebook, going to Google, going to Amazon, going to TikTok, and then all of the engagement that you have with those organizations, the data that is created, the exhaust data, your keystrokes, the time you hover, everything you do, everything you tap, everything you click is owned by them and they turn that data into action. You have no say in it whatsoever. You might be able to talk, uh, to make some selections in your privacy policy, but at the end of the day, you are not the sovereign owner of your data, they are. So when I think about a, mo uh, a modern idea of a metaverse as opposed to what we would think about as Roblox or Decentraland, which are two very different kind of metaverses. Roblox is a web two metaverse. It's three dimensions represented on a two dimensional plane, you can experience it with a VR headset, but that's not the way most people do. When you go there, you're logging in with a, a password and a username. You, they know who you are, you know who they are, and they control your data set. You go to Decentraland, it's a little bit different. There, you log in with your uh, digital wallet. So you've got a wallet identification. It might be in, uh, a wallet that has uh, ETH in it. It might be a wallet that has another uh, kind of token or coin. One way or the other, the wallet identifies you to Decentraland and you can make a purchase with that wallet. They have their own currency called MANA in Decentraland and it runs completely separately. Now, there's a subtle distinction and it's ever so slightly technical, but I think it's important it, and it's easy to understand. Web 2, which is the web we're in right now, and it's been around since, call it 2001, 2002. Mm -hmm. Web 1 would have been 1998 when we get right. the first, we get Mosaic, we get Netscape, you, H, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, TCP, IP. Brochures digitally online. Pretty much. You, what would happen is there'd be a hyperlink, now we just call them links, and it would either link somewhere else on the web page or to another yeah. web page. But ultimately, there was not a lot of data being exchanged, just no from place to place. Right. Web 2 is this data exchange. You go to Facebook, I say, hey, open up your Facebook app. You start scrolling. It scrolls at 60 frames a second. It's amazing how fast that paints. You hit, you know, you tap and it stops. Whatever you're looking at is an absolutely custom built newsfeed based on everything you've ever done in your history with Facebook. That's Web2. All Web2 websites, all have IP addresses mm -hmm. and, and they are coming from a server Right, mm -hmm. it's serving the web page, and it has an actual real live address. There's a computer racked up somewhere, and either a virtual server in, in it as software running like with a bunch of other virtual servers, or there's one server running on this piece of hardware. If you pull the plug out of the wall, the website goes away. It's gone. There's one address, one server. It's serving you a web page. It's serving you the data. It may go get the data from somewhere. The data has an address. A physical address, 192.168.1.1 is the address of everybody's router in their home. But a, a schema like that, 3.3.3.3 is called IPv4. And every single thing you've ever got on a web page anywhere that you're doing now has a physical address. Yep. When you have a Web3 website, that can't be true by definition. And the reason it can't be true is that the difference between Web2 and Web3 is the difference between something that is centralized, like at Facebook or Amazon or Google, and something decentralized. It will be in a mesh network or a peer-to-peer -peer network. So instead of having a web address, a URL, that actually says the, the physical address of the web page, what you have is a content ID. Why? Because that piece of content may be on 500 computers or 1,000 computers around the internet, and the one that's closest to you is where you're going to download it from. So when I'm a part of a Web3 uh, mesh network or a decentralized network or a peer-to-peer -peer Web3 network, I'm contributing a little bit of my process or a little bit of my hard drive, and I am earning back because my self-sovereign identification or my decentralized identification belongs to me, my data belongs to me. And so we're seeing these ideas called learn uh, earn, uh, learn to earn or engage to earn or play to earn or watch to earn. So you go to a, a, a site like Theta.tv. Theta is a decentralized YouTube. You lend them a little bit of your hard drive. You lend them a little bit of, of bandwidth uh, you, from your internet connection. And when you watch, you earn Theta tokens. Audius is a audio version of Spotify. Same kind of thing. Decentraland is a metaverse, but it's a decentralized metaverse. And it's a metaverse where you can share in the value you help create. And so there are the promise of Web3 is this concept of centralization versus decentralization. Now, here's the problem. The decentralized world assumes 
if you read, go back to read the 2008 Satoshi Nakamoto Bitcoin white paper on decentralized currency, which is Bitcoin, it assumes trustless transactions. I don't know you, you don't know me, we're still safe. But most of the things you do with a brand, and I know you want to bring this to supply chain, which is why I'm taking this back here. Most of the things you do with a brand, you do in either a community of passion, a community of practice, or a community of interest, and you trust the brand. So I go to Facebook. I'm going to Facebook. If I'm going to uh, the NBA Top Shot, which is a basketball NFT yeah. site, basketball is the attraction. I trust the NBA. I am in a community of passion around the game of basketball. And the NBA is the actual central authority that I not only trust, I like to hate them. I love to love them. They, they control the rules. I mean, there's all kinds of things Adam Silver does that piss people off and make them happy. But I'm never questioning the idea that the NBA is the trusted authority mm -hmm. in basket, for basketball internationally. So what do I need decentralized tools for if I have a central authority? If I go to the NFL and I've got a ticketed, uh, if I buy a ticket and the ticket's an NFT, well, of course the NFL has the right to be a trusted authority in that environment. I'm buying a ticket to an NFL game, of course they're the central authority. A little bit different if I mint an NFT of a drunken ape or a bored ape or a something else, any kind of ape, and I put it out in the universe and all NFTs are smart contracts. And the difference between a smart contract and a regular contract is really simple. A smart contract is just like any contract you've ever had in your life. The difference is that when the terms and conditions are met, the contract executes automatically. And what normally happens is cryptocurrency is instantly and automatically exchanged. So <clears throat> my NFT sells to somebody in an exchange. And I don't know who bought it, but the minute that it sells, I get paid. It, it's so interesting, and, and we, we don't have enough time to, you know, get into this. But I appreciate the level set there that you just did because I've been a part of the internet since its inception. You know, I got my first email address in 1994 when no one knew what it was, and I had no one to send anything to, um, and it was just going to chat sites. I didn't know what was going on, and that was back when don't use your real name and all this other stuff. But you know what else was happening at that time? Still happening at that time? You'd go out to dinner, or you'd go to a, re or a retailer, and you'd pull out a credit card. And they would put it on this device that was not connected to anything. It just had carbon copy paper underneath it. And they would run your numbers over it. And then it would go back to a filing. And then at the end, either at the end of the day or the end of the week, they would process everything. So nobody changes all at once. Everything is a transition period. And you have leading, bleeding edge adopters and your middle adopters and your laggards. And, you know, all that's happening. And, and so... You know, let, let's transition over to this this conversation about supply chains, okay? Because I think what people are like, the middle of the road folks are just catching up to Web 2.0, right? They're, they're realizing, and I, I personally think the pandemic has put a huge spotlight on this because if we hit this pandemic in 1985 or the 1980s, we would be in a world depression right now. That, that's my personal belief. We would be in a world depression, right? Probably. Or we wouldn't have a pandemic at all because we didn't travel that much and we didn't share information that much and blah, blah, blah. So we, we can splice it anyway. But if let's just say it got to this spot because nowadays all the folks that couldn't go to work work from home. All the folks that got laid off started an online business. I mean, Etsy, Shopify, they're through the roof right now. Amazon, fulfilled by Amazon, um, you know, all this is through the roof. So what that tells me at a macro level is it's scale. I create one thing and I'm not selling. Earlier we were talking about concerts, you know, reminiscing about concerts. You go to a concert, it's a physical event. They're not anymore. Concerts are not physical events. We have beautiful Sono systems at home and sound bars on TVs and all of these other things. And, you know, it's global. It's global in its instance. And I think that the Web 3.0 and this metaverse is going to put strains on supply chains that we haven't seen before. But it also provides opportunity for advancements. So I'd really be curious as to how you think it might impact supply chains. Well, there are a couple of different ways. Um, let's break it down. First of all, if you start from the premise that we have a new way to exchange value, then you have a new way to think about supply chain. So let's just break that down for a second. 
You use concerts as an example. It's a great example. Musicians have been screwed by record labels and recorded music companies since the beginning of the recorded music business. They're not necessarily business people. Because you're a great performer doesn't make you a genius. It makes you a great performer. And a lot of these people have been taken advantage of and they've died of drug overdoses, penniless, and like the stories are tragic. Here's a new creator class. And you know what's allowing us to be here today online, I'm sitting in front of a Sony A66 ca 100 camera with uh, an f1.4 16 millimeter wide angle lens. I've got lights. I'm in a 4K environment. I can make all the video I want all day long. Uh, I've got a pretty high quality audio set up here as well. Everyone's a content company. Everyone's a creator. And the creator economy has evolved. And what the promise of Web3, not the realization. So remember, this isn't real right. yet. It's becoming real. And we're all, all of us are the architects of what this is going to be. But imagine if I could share in the value that I create without a middle person or middleman, uh, to use the term. And what I mean by that is a smart contract, as we talked about earlier, is just like a regular contract, the difference is that when the terms and conditions are met, the contract executes automatically and you can represent a smart contract with an NFT, a non-fungible token. I can use that along with either tokens or coins, a token being a cryptocurrency that you uh, create on someone else's blockchain, a coin being a currency you create on a blockchain you control. If I have NFTs that represent value and I have a way to exchange value using a currency or a token, a coin or a token, the entire economy has changed. When do I need that token to become fiat currency? So mm -hmm. let's keep your concert thing going. I need a bass player, I need a drummer. My, I'm a band, but mostly I'm a front person, I'm the singer. And that there are people who are coming to see and I wanna fill in. I've got my keyboard player that always goes with me, but I need a guitarist, a bass player, I need a couple singers, backup singers, professional musicians, in the, and I need an audio mixer, and I need some lighting people. If they would accept notes, my noties, my new cryptocurrency that's part of the music concert world, as opposed to green dollars. If they would get paid in cryptocurrency and their contracts would all say, when you complete your job, it, boom, it's, it's in your digital wallet, it's done. I've got a completely new way to do business. And by the way, if we sell any merch that night that you helped us sell, you get a piece of that because those NFTs represent the physical contract goods. Automatically. Is Right. So I've got the concessions person there who's selling my swag and every one of those, uh, every hoodie, every T-shirt, every Rubik's Cube with my logo on it has an NFT associated with it. And the transaction is getting rid of the blockchain. And everybody who's part of this has some part of that smart contract. No one has to trust anybody. No one has to trust the record company. No one just has to trust the manager or the lawyer or the agent or the accountant. It's done. So this is a really different way to share in the value you've created. If you're the supplier and you're bringing the swag to the concert venue, when it gets checked in, you get paid. You don't send an invoice. It's done. It's done. The crypto is in your wallet. So is that crypto going to be used um, on it? Will you take it either to a decentralized exchange or an exchange, a centralized exchange like Coinbase and turn it into fiat currency or, or, well, it just represent credits. And when you have enough credits, you go back to the main company and say, I now, now have 575 credits, give me cash. Like for right. example, I'm a composer producer by trade. I think a lot of people know that, that I started my career writing music for television. Music. So He's ASCAP, got the jingles. He's got yeah, the jingles. I wrote a lot of jingles, a lot of TV themes, a lot of TV news themes, but I'm, I'm a, a, a member of ASCAP and that is a performing rights society. When my music gets played on television, on the radio, which it does all over the world every day, uh, it shows up in an ASCAP survey, and once a quarter, they send you money. But the money you get is based on a survey, and every quarter, they determine how many dollars a song credit is worth. Because it's different, because of what they collect every quarter, and how much they survey, how much music was played, and it floats. Right. So, it, and and we get cash based on the credits that we've earned giving a, during a given quarter. So, the, the mechanisms to think that way actually exist everywhere. Yeah. The question is, how do you, what, what cost comes out of the system? Imagine if I automated all of my auditing and inventory management in my supply chain by making every physical good I deliver a part of a smart contract. 
and I had an NFT. You could use a non fungible token to represent it, but you don't need to. It could just be a smart contract. It doesn't actually need to be a GIF or a JPEG file that people, or a piece of music or a video. A, a, a smart contract, or an, I'm sorry, an NFT, which is, um, if you're doing it on Ethereum, it's ERC-721 or ERC 1155. They're open source contracts. You can go look at them on Open Zeppelin. You see the writing. You see the metadata you can put in there. You can write your own smart contracts that have your own set of metadata. Remember when XML files started thinking of supply chain and mm -hmm. in the fashion business, we, we did an XML project. Oh, it goes back forever, 20, 30 years ago when XML started happening. Some manufacturers called their pants pants. Some called them slacks. Some called them trousers. Sure. Some called them chinos. Some called them khakis. We do it well, Right. Khakis were a color, but they're also a kind of pair of pants. So that when you do an XML file for inventory, like that's a real, that used now you do, you know, you write scripts and AI handles it or just great up, you know, straight up decision trees are easy to write. But back then, you know, when we were still struggling with databases, this I, 25, 30 years ago, it was hard, right? So here you would, you'd want to build um, maybe a decentralized autonomous organization around a community of passion or a community of practice called a DAO, a D-A-O. And basically you can think of a DAO as a Discord channel with a shared wallet or a Twitter account with a shared wallet, any community. So if your community is a community of strangers that all happen to just like basketball, that's one kind of thing. You could also have a community around, I am a, uh, we, we are the suppliers of things that concert venues need. We are a supplier of things that supermarkets need. We are a supermarket, here's the DAO of our suppliers for produce. Yes. Yeah, and now, the, the way I want everyone to think about this is a little differently than I think other people might suggest. In 1982, my Apple II Plus arrived and uh, with its 140K <laughs> floppy disk and eight, I think, K of memory. Uh, memory. I don't think, I think the RAM, I think it was eight kilobytes. I, I don't even, there wasn't even a megabyte. It, no, right? it, it, was, it was ridiculous. Um, it was in 40 years it changed the world. It I mean, it democratized the information. What we're doing today couldn't be done if that Apple II Plus didn't show up. And then a few years later, the IBM PC and all of all of information technology. I remember in college booking time at uh, the computer center to run my punch cards so I could yeah. run my program at two o'clock in the morning. I get my butt out of bed and go and run my program or leaving it there with a $5 bill in the rubber band inside my punch card. I said, please, please, God, run this by the morning. I have a class, <laughs> right? Who could imagine back then that all of that would lead to this? I want to interject here because I couldn't agree with you more. But I think what happens, you know, like when I talk to family members, I'm the IT guy, you know, they, I'm the self-taught nerd and all that stuff. And they kind of, I need to bring it back down to, 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 to level it out for them. And so I start using some simple analogies or just some common known things. I love the fact that you brought up the Apple IIe. Had one. You know, my friend had one. I didn't have one. And we had the modem next to a beer, you know, plugging it into the phone and all that stuff. Sounds and no child born this century will ever know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all those things, right? So anyway, but, um, you know, the New York Stock Exchange, that was a big school trip for me growing up. Right. You go there and you really look from the outside and so many people, there's no people on it anymore. It's all digitized. Right. And so I think what, what people forget is, OK, well, you're talking about efficiencies and building it in. And I'm like, yes, but there is compounded math on the efficiencies that affect the physical supply chain. And we saw we saw it here in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We have the supplies. We can't let the physical world doesn't catch up with the digital world. That is the challenge because, you know, we're, we have this one up, one down concept of contracts within supply chain. I can see one up and I can see one down, but I don't want to see others. The computer programmers have all figured all that out. Sure. We're working through some of those challenges and smart contracts and all this. But your smart contracts is just that. It can be a multi-layered smart contract. And when I think of it, I was talking to my wife. Um, she's a physical education and health teacher. And she's like, you're, you're geeking out on me. And I'm like, honey, we have a garage sale as a community once a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We sold a lot of stuff this year. I'm like, yeah. I have a garage sale every single day. And I can set it and forget it. And when it, it reaches its moment, someone will take it. And Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, eBay, Etsy, any of these environments that have been around. And this is Web 2.0 stuff. So now when we move into this metaverse, it's all the time 
everywhere. Well, I think there's another way to look at it, Reed. I think there's another way to look at it. Efficiency is table stakes. Anybody wants a, a Stripe account, you can take a credit card. Anybody wants a website, you can go to Wix and get an e-commerce site in 30 seconds. We did a that the gobble wobble up here at Stratton Mountain over Thanksgiving, the 5K run. At, at the end, like the finish line, there were tables all set up, you know, people selling baked goods and crafts right. and all that Vermonty stuff, you know, maple syrup that we all do up here up in Vermont. In the, um, everybody had a website. Everybody could take a credit card. They had a dongle QR on their phone. Codes everywhere. Everywhere. And, uh, you know, a couple of guys were willing to take ETH and Matic um, as, as their payment. But the most important thing is that it's table stakes. Efficiency is table stakes. You know what's not table stakes? Adaptability to the accelerated pace of change. The ability to turn data into actionable outcomes. Because if you cannot turn data into uh, an actionable outcome right now, then then you are doomed. And the agility and ability to adapt to the pace of change. We used to for years, our practice was we help you accelerate the digital transfer your digital transformation. I don't think I've met an executive in the last 24 months that feels like the transformation isn't going fast enough. It's right. going just fine. Thank you. The problem is no one can adapt to it. That's and right. so what we are doing in our consulting practice now is working really hard with all of our clients, not on the efficiencies, because that literally, if, if you're taking a data stream about your inventory and AI has been trained to understand inventory management, you are doing it at the highest level of decision making and your competitors are too. So that's even, even, even. The question is, when something changes and you know that tomorrow afternoon it's going to change again. So you can't dig into a six month project or a 12 month project that's going to cost a ton of money and take a time, ton of time and resources when you are dead not sure. I built a Death Star. Someone's building Death Star 2 at 3 p.m. today. And when I wake up in the morning, Death Star 2 is going to beat Death Star 1. Death Star 1 is not scheduled to launch for 18 months. And right. I've been beaten, beaten by Death Star 2 by three o'clock. How do you adapt to that? Because that's where we are now. We're not at a place where I have to worry about being efficient. That is like, otherwise you can't be in business. The differentiator is the way your team, like your team of teams are organized. How transparent can you be? How fluid and dynamic can you be? How uh, resilient can you be when some outside stimulus you absolutely cannot control shows yeah. up and you're like, wow, I wasn't expecting this. Shame on you. Shame on you at this point. This drops right on to customer experience and customer service at the same time because the expectations are so much higher than what they were just three years ago. Yeah. Right? To totally Absolutely. Higher. No, Listen. look, people are spoiled, Reed. You know that. Everybody wants what they want. At CES this year, what we saw was extraordinary use of ordinary technology, but more than anything else, we saw customization, personalization, and storytelling in the context of technology. Yeah. So I'm using tech to tell a story or empower someone to experience something that is a story. I've got a story about how they're getting it done. And all everyone knows what a monitor is. Everyone knows what a camera is. Everybody knows what a light is. Everybody knows what a, you know, everybody knows what all, a, a Peloton got in trouble. Why? It's a treadmill with a monitor and a trainer and an arrogance level and a great story that wasn't a good story anymore. So they didn't change the story and the technology everybody has, it's commoditized. How hard is it to slap a monitor on an exercise bike and get some content? And the answer is not that hard. So it's you had a great story. Companies go from so small to so big to so small again. Again, adaptability. They didn't adapt their story. They overbooked their supply chain. They didn't pay attention in class. That, like that was a management problem. That wasn't a technology problem and it wasn't a supply chain problem. And if you really dig deep in every supply chain problem that I've ever seen, once in a while, there's something you literally can't, there's an earthquake, there's a the pandemic. I don't think a lot of people had, you know, a boat you know, stuck coming. <laughs> there, there, were thing, there are things that happen there just like, wow, okay, that's a once in a hundred year event and it happened twice in the last three years. We just got unlucky. But more often than not, when you see a giant disruption in a normal supply chain, it's not supply shock like we have right now. It is just bad management. Mm -hmm. And that bad management comes from stuck in waterfalls, stuck in the old ways, stuck in like that's, you know, we've been doing it this way for 50 years as opposed to what Charles Darwin wrote in, um, in Origin of Species, uh, on Origin of Species by Natural Selection, his book in 1859, predates the discovery of DNA. Everyone shorthands that book as survival of the fittest. That is not what it says. It doesn't say anything like that at all. That book is completely about survival of the most adaptable. The ability to adapt to the environment in all extreme changes to pass on your genes to the next generation and whatever, whatever entities can do that best, 
are here now and anything that couldn't do that is extinct. So when you talk about Darwinism, uh, what you're really talking about is not survival of the fittest. You can be very fit and very fragile. You can bleed. You, you know, superheroes bleed. Nobody gets any points for missing the iceberg if you're captaining right. the Titanic. No one get, makes a movie about that person. Nobody. They make a movie about the unsinkable Molly Brown, the hero in the lifeboat. Look at the crisis that had to happen for that person to be a hero. Properly handled, that situation never occurs for her to right. be a hero. We never hear about it. Some mm -hmm. boring second-in-command person gives that iceberg a three-mile you know, loop because they were cautious about it and they were boring. And we don't even want to tell like your eyes are glazing over just thinking about it. That is the best run supply chain in the world where every that. iceberg is avoided. Yeah. But best best run supply chain is boring. boring. It takes a lot. It takes a lot. Yeah. Smelly. I, I mean, we, we've been at this for over a half hour. I mean, we're, we're running out of time. We've got a couple of things to, to close up on, but I could speak to you all day. And mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate what you're doing for us. The, the information you provide to your community. I, I really encourage others to, to check you out. Um, the, the times that we are living in right now are historic and I, I look back, I'm, I'm getting a little old now, you know, like the, the beard's coming in gray and the hair doesn't even come in. So, but it, it blows my mind. This is going to make the industrial revolution. This, that, that was like a weekend. You're geeking out. Everyone today uses email without thinking about it. Everyone today uses text chat without thinking about it. If you take a picture and you send it to a friend without thinking about it, but it won't be very hard for anyone who was not born digital to remember the day someone said, we're using email now. And you're like, what? <laughs> we have to do a spreadsheet. We have to what? <laughs> we're going to word process everything from now on. We're doing PDF files. We're going to, what's a, like everybody's been there. Me, Jelly, fax that information over to uh, me. All right. Yeah, I'll definitely fax it to you. Everybody's been there. And so, this is a time to learn. And what a great thing that is. Like all of a sudden we get to wake up every morning and go, new stuff. When's the and last time we had super new stuff that we would really benefit from? So I would implore you all, don't get scared. I, just go for it. I, I forget who the futurist is and it's, oh, I'm, I feel so bad. But his quote was, the illiterate of today will be those that can't unlearn to relearn. Yeah, that's so true. And, and I, I was like, that is profound. That's a profound statement, and it's very true. Liz, I know you have uh, two two quick uh, closing questions, and, and then we'll be able to wrap this up. I do, and I just want to thank you, too, because this has been super fascinating just to hear how all of this is coming to fruition. And I have so many more questions for you, but we don't have time for it. So the first question, and I'm excited to hear your answer. I think you're going to have a little different spin on it than, than typically. What is your favorite piece of technology? right now a ballpoint pen <laughs> i love it different spin <laughs> love it what? you want to elaborate a little bit i know yeah you can use it to change the world very very it's awesome very true I mean, very there, there isn't there isn't anything more powerful than story and the way you communicate a story is by writing it down you I mean you could you could that's where it starts. So, yeah, I mean, look, the written word is the technology of choice. It is the mind blowing technology. It's the mind expanding technology. It's the ballpoint pen is my metaphor for it. But but the ability what's happened to me this year and through the pandemic, it, it's been horrible for, on so many levels. I've lost some friends. It's been hard economically for so many. We've been very lucky. My family's been blessed. We're all healthy. But I, there was a silver lining for me. Aside from the immense amount of family time I got to spend, which was a blessing and that I had no understanding how great a blessing it would be. Um, and my wife and I still talk to each other, which is amazing. Uh, what, what I got a chance to do was take linear algebra, wave theory. I went to the, I, I, I went to un the best universities in the world and got the greatest free lectures in physics, in AI, in machine learning, in music, in the things I love, like the, I, just the amount I could learn that I didn't know, all those things that were like, I'm going to get to it or I want to do it. And then something crazy happened in the middle of the pandemic. I started questioning the assumptions that I had, my arrogance about my knowledge. It's like, well, I, I'm, I, I'd start to talk, someone asked me a question, I'd start to answer it. I go, do I, do I know that's true? 
Is that a wonder? And I would spend then I would answer however I would answer. Then I would go research and you start going down these paths that are enlightening. And all of a sudden you realize it's like that classic, you know, cliche metaphor. You're at the, you get to the top of the hill and you see that the hill is way higher. Like it keeps going. Yeah. The blessing of that, the ability to just that, that has been amazing to me. And the thing that I, that I came out when, you know, when people say to me, what's the most important technology ever, it's the ability for humans to tell a story to each other, which allow them to organize and change the world. That's awesome. Liz, you got one more. We got I do. I do. And, and I, you may have already answered it kind of in the, in the way that you answered the first, but what, what's blowing your mind? What, what is blowing your mind with the world today? Whether it's technology, whether it's something that, that happened years ago that kind of remains with you, what blows your mind? The amplification of ignorance. Mm. It is heartbreaking <laughs> and mind blowing. I have never seen more people with less knowledge scream louder and be amplified greater. When you know the sky is blue and people are telling you it's green and they are willing to kill over it. Yes. We are, we are in a new place. And mm -hmm. this blows my mind because what you learn is that facts don't have emotional impact. And so a story, the best narrative wins, not the truth. And, That's right. if, and that blows my mind. The best narrative wins I've always known because I grew up in the TV business. I know that the best narrative gets the best ratings. But the idea that the best narrative wins in the world and that facts don't matter, mm -hmm. this I find mind blowing. And the amplification of, of that level of ignorance has just every day when I see it, I, I want to be less surprised and I'm never less surprised. And I think this is, we're going to have to get a handle on that as a species because it by itself is probably the most powerful of all the destructive forces, the ability right. to just believe something that is so patently wrong mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it's the movie. Don't look up. Yeah. But yeah. It, you know, but the real IRL, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that blows my mind. Sh yeah. Shelly, you introduced me at CES in 2019 to deep fakes. You yeah. gave a presentation and I shared that with Liz earlier this week and uh, it was the the fake Tom Cruise on YouTube, just YouTube it. I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable. And she's like, what? He, he looks like Tom Cruise. I go, no, that's the whole thing. He doesn't. It's terrifying. And, it, it, and so, like, it's that story. But listen, again, just a couple of recaps. You know, efficiency is table stakes. You know, we all have to be doing that. We're all looking at automation, but it will catch up to you. And adaptability is the real game changer here. You know, it, it, it's a creator's economy. Um, we have centralization and decentralization. You, you can't fight it. You can't fight it. You know, SSID and DID are conversations, I can tell you, that GS1 US has been in for the last three years. Um, and we're continuing. We, we talk with Microsoft. We talk with Google. We talk with all industry startups and mainstay players because it is. There's a real fear that a couple of big technology companies are going to rule the world. And if we allow ignorance to happen, that can happen. It could be OK, but we're putting all of our trust into a couple of environments. Whereas with SSID and DID, we can really kind of pull back because it's not the 1900s anymore. This isn't an industrial revolution. This is a digital revolution that was started over 25 years ago and is is just getting ready to to really hit its stride and take off and um, you know Moore's law every year it gets smaller and cheaper in technology that's how Intel runs their whole chip company and it's so Shelly thank you again for being on the show really appreciate the enlightenment um, and for our listeners there's a lot more to come but this is going to impact supply chains there's no doubt thanks again Thank you for joining the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US. If you enjoyed today's show, you can subscribe to our feed or explore more great episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to share and follow us on social media. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.